97.3 ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four with 97.3 ESPN.com's Andrew DeCecco. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. You know, we, we recognize the, the ability of the roster that's, that's put together right now. And I think we have the ability to do something really special uh, with this group, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast and brought to you by PlaySugarHouse.com. Sign up now. They'll match your first deposit up to $250. Go to PlaySugarHouse.com. Win real money with their sports books along with casino games from the comfort of your home. Must be 21 or older to play. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Andrew DeCecco is taking a look down at what happened yesterday and really what's going to happen going forward here. So much to get into. This team has a lot of issues, but Andrew, it seems that it's the same issues every week. It's Is it the coach's play calling game plan? Is it the quarterback? Is it the injuries? I mean, they went through, what, nine offensive linemen yesterday. When you look back at that game, is there any one thing that stands out, or is it a culmination of this is just a bad football team? Yeah, hard to pinpoint one particular area of concern, Mike. It's it's definitely one of those things where it's from, from top to bottom, it's just one of those it's one of those deals where the offensive line is not good enough. The quarterback's not good enough. The coaching isn't good enough. Um, the defense is inconsistent. You talk about making some stops against the run and then surrendering a, a touchdown after that. That's not, that's not winning football. And uh, what you're saying is the culmination of a culmination of things. And that's why the Eagles sit where they sit right now and really don't have any answers. All right. So how much of this then, you know, of all the culmination sits in the lap of the quarterback. I mean, we just were talking about something that if everything stayed status quo, Doug Peterson's game plan was the same. The injuries were the same. Everything was status quo, but that the quarterback just played better. Is that enough that this team would go from losing some of these games to winning some of these games? Because I'm looking back at their schedule and saying, They've been essentially within one score almost every single game this year. If the quarterback just plays a little better and everything else stays the same, is that enough or is it? No, not. it's not as simple as Carson Wentz just playing better. Um, no, I, I think that's, that's a fair assessment. I think if you're getting better, more consistent quarterback play, competent quarterback play in some of those games, some of those throws are completed. Um, they're, they're, they're playing more of a, he's playing more of a complete game rather than turning it on in the second half. I think you're looking at, you know, you probably, you probably have two more wins there and, um, look, it, it's not all on Carson Wentz. I don't want to sit here and make it seem like it's all about the quarterback. The coaching has to be better. They have to find ways to, to work around Carson's skill set. You talk about moving him outside the pocket. We talked about that at length last week. That has happened. I believe it happened once yesterday in the fourth quarter that that can't happen. And just the it's it's just a uh, you know it's a stew of of, of, of issues here, and that, and that's why the Eagles are in the situation that they're in. What do you think about Doug Peterson committing to the run early? Now Miles Sanders can't fumble that football, and that is a problem with him. Mm-hmm. But he did get away from it pretty early. Your thoughts on the run game and and how Doug did what Doug normally does? I thought the the game plan, Hunter, initial the initial game plan to come out running and, and get Carson kind of settled in and into a rhythm. You know, obviously the weather dictated that, but I thought that that was the right approach. And, and, and you know, they found some success. You saw they got a good mixture of Miles and, and Boston Scott. I believe Miles played 60% of the snaps and Boston Scott played 40%. Um, that, obviously that fumble was inexcusable, but that's certainly not a reason to get away from the run by any means. I, I think Miles, uh, at, by halftime, Miles Sanders had 14 carries. And then in the second half, we had two. These are these kind of these kind of miscues are, are continuously happening, and, and when you have an offense that's so inept right now, when you actually have one thing that's working, the running game, um, why get away from that? Why why have that headstrong mentality that you're going to go through the air and try to pick up yards that way? It's just not working. You don't have the personnel for it uh, along the offensive line. You had guys shuffling in and out. And, and your quarterback was standing back there getting battered. He wasn't seeing the field particularly well on top of that and, and, and in previous weeks. You know, why go away from what's working? And I think it's just an overall stubbornness that's, that's kind of 
uh, it's kind of been a culmination of things. Yeah, I mean, that f- I'm wondering how much they ran the ball, they ran the ball, and then he fumbles. The fumble kind of gets dug away, and then you lose Jason Kelsey. You've got, uh, what, he had to use nine different offensive linemen uh, mm-hmm. scenarios yesterday. I'm wondering how much of that kind of uh, altered their, their play calling and game plan at all. Yeah, I mean, it always seems like like Doug abandons the run when a team sort of starts to build a, a lead, or if he's like, okay, that's enough, let's get back to you know the bread and butter here, the passing game, and you know go to try and reestablish that aerial attack. Uh, I, I mean, look, the offensive line has been in, in, in been in flux all season long. That's really not an excuse. Teams across the league have injuries, and and they still find more of a balance on offense and. Um, on, in the first half, the Eagles were tremendously balanced on offense, and they they get away from that, and and the game starts to spiral away from them. I I I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, look, I, I thought that the offensive line did with Isaac say Malu back got a decent enough push in there. I thought in, in pass protection they were atrocious. I mean Olivier Vernon, um, you know, they made Olivier Vernon look like LT. Um, and certainly, I mean, the mo for the for the Browns' defensive line outside of Miles Garrett was that they could not generate pressure from the other three guys, and they went into that game with six sacks, and they they left there with I believe it was like five sacks um, from all those guys. So I mean, it's just inexcusable. Yeah, I want to stick with the offensive line. I got two questions. One, should Jason Peters start at left tackle, even though Doug Peterson said yes? I wonder if he even has final say. And what's the situation with Pryor? It just makes no sense. He almost sounded like Opeto beat him out for the job. Herbig. Oh, Herbig, excuse me. Herbig, not Pryor. Right. Herbig. Right. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned it because I just uh, – actually, I had a thought on that that I, that I wrote about last night. And, no, I don't think Jason Peters should be the left tackle moving forward. I think that, that should go – those snaps would be more better suited to go to a Jordan Mailata, a 23-year-old who the team's invested in. He's going to give maximum effort, and he's shown signs of being you know, a, a, a player worth developing. I think that they would be better suited to roll with him at left tackle. Yeah, Matt Pryor, Matt, Matt Pryor hey, how many times are they going to roll him out there and, and see that he's not who they thought he was going into the season? Throw Jack Driscoll in there at right guard. Get Sue Opet in there at right guard. Nate Herbig, whomever. Because at this point now, it's about getting those guys ready for the future. Getting those guys valuable snaps for the future. Jack Driscoll is a player who's shown that he can that he can play at a relatively high level for a rookie. And I think that when you look at the right guard spot there, it's kind of been, you know, it's been a conundrum there all season long. They've been looking for an answer. I, I think you know, get Jordan Mailata and get Jack Driscoll there at, at, at left guard and right tackle or and right guard, uh, respectively, and, and kind of go from there because the, the offensive line right now is, is very old and they have so many moving parts all season. I think that getting those two young players in there would help from a stability standpoint and also for getting them ready for the, for the future. Andrew, Doug has been pressed and questioned about benching Carson Wentz. Is that a fair question or is it ridiculous to – you know, consider that if you're Doug Peterson. I mean, he mentioned, what message am I sending to my team if I bench my franchise quarterback? Is that a fair answer, or, you know, is he protecting his kids? Should he and his and this organization be discussing making a quarterback change? Well, yeah, I do think it's a fair question, and, and there's two sides to that. Yeah, he could be sending a uh, – he could look at it as sending a, you know – a bad message to his team by benching Carson Wentz with so much to play for, or he could be also kind of conveying the message that, you know, mediocre play, you can continuously play mediocre and you're going to be, and he's going to keep trotting you out there. Um, I think right now it's not necessarily one Jalen hurts is not going to save the day by any means. That's not going to happen. He's not going to rescue the offense, but I do think that maybe putting him in for a series, maybe, Taking having having a game there where Carson Wentz is on the sideline, not a permanent thing, but sometimes from a quarterback's perspective, you have to hit the reset button and you kind of see the game from from a different perspective. And I think that that would present that. Um, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily fair to put Jalen Hurts uh, into this situation where there's not any continuity on offense. The offensive line's not good. It wouldn't really do much do much benefit for Jalen Hurts right now. I mean, he's not going to kind of give the offense a shot in the arm because because of the play calling. It's just not good enough. 
So I'm not really sure what that would what that would really accomplish. And look, they have a lot of financials and, and, and draft capital attached to Carson. That's their guy. They've made that very clear. And and I think it, they they need to they need to stick with them. Now the approach that I would do is let's look at let's look at the play caller the play calling. Let's probably switch that up and see if Carson gets different results from that. I do want to get your thoughts on. They highlighted this a couple of times throughout the broadcast and. When you look at the lack of separation from the jump at the line of scrimmage from some of these skill players, are you seeing an issue there? Yeah, I am. Definitely. Like from Travis to- Yeah, like Travis Fogum, he had this hot spurt and now he come back he came back to reality a bit. Like how much of a problem is that compared to, you know, Carson Wentz just missing these guys? Like there's been a lot of talk about that Jalen Rager play specifically that came on the interception with Wentz. He's missing all these wide open guys, which he definitely is. But how much of it is him missing it and how much of it is, look, their, their plays aren't there to be made because your skill players aren't doing a good enough job at the line of scrimmage. Right. And and that's something that I won't be able to, uh, that I won't, I don't want to speculate on without watching the all 22 tape. But what I can tell you, Hunter, is it's, it's, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. These receivers aren't winning their one-on-one matchups. And man, the Eagles also, also aren't doing a good enough job scheming these guys open. Travis Fulgham, is a guy that didn't get a target until the third until the third quarter. Granted, he had a couple of drops and and he was looked at in the second half, but he's not helping his quarterback. Um, Jalen Rager to me is is, a, is an interesting story because I think that some of those plays that they throw these short dump offs to a to a Greg Ward and let him kind of roam in space, I think that they would be better suited doing that to someone like Jalen Rager and really taking advantage of his explosive traits and athleticism. That to me doesn't really, uh, never really sat well with me because you have this rookie here who can add some juice to the offense and they just don't use him. In the case of Travis Fulgham, I think that the opportunities to have been there and he hasn't come up with the football. And I think there's other, also other opportunities where he's just simply not winning his matchups. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, look, and I think Doug has had, um, you know, I don't, I don't love the offense, but I definitely am not as uh, down on, look, I think if Carson just makes a couple competent reads and throws, you know, some of these games are a little different. I mean, really, uh, the, 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 the constant turnovers in their own end of the mm-hmm. field is killing this team. Uh, but that being said, sometimes I scratch my head. I like a bubble screen. I don't like a bubble screen to Greg Ward. Why can't the bubble screen be for Jalen Rager? Find ways, creative ways to get the ball into his hands. And now I've seen them run this little jet thing where they have him in motion in the backfield. They have two uh, receivers out in front. Both times that play has got blown up. So it seems like they've got a good intention there. But, you know, the bubble screen to Ward. Why? Ward's the slowest of the receivers you got out there. Um, Mm -hmm. Why would you throw a bubble screen to him? So I do think Doug could do a better job of getting these guys there. But ultimately, I mean, is it, is it this uh, greatest show on turf? No. But when you watch that all 22, I think you're going to see guys open and just a quarterback's reluctance to want to throw the ball for whatever reason. It seems that, look, this offense, Andrew, is the same offense they've been running for a couple of years. Carson's had to have sat down and said, these are plays that I like. These are plays I feel comfortable with. And for whatever reason, if the offense is the same, there's one thing that's different. And his completion percentage and his decision-making, to me, is at the top of the list at what's different. Yeah, you get the nail on the head there, Mike. And uh, there, there, are, there, I'd be remiss if I failed to mention that there, you know, there are guys open. There, there are plays to be made down the field. Not all the time, but, the, but a lot of those times when he, he just simply isn't seeing them. He's not seeing the field very well. He's not playing the game a confident quarterback is and some of that comes from just the the, the coaching and, and not coaching to his strengths and, and the offensive the poor offensive line play uh it's just it's just so many different things that have kind of transpired to to, to lead him down this path but um yeah i mean there are there are there are plays to be made i mean you even saw on the richard rogers touchdown where carson hesitated on that he made a nice throw in the end zone that finally get the, t- the touchdown but um, I mean, he, he didn't even look too sure of himself on, on, on that read. I mean, these are just, you know, routine things that he just wasn't, that he wasn't, that he was kind of executing with perfection a couple of seasons ago. Right. I mean, it was almost like, oh my God, there's a guy wide open. And it was like, he had the yips. He didn't want to throw it right away. It was like, mm-hmm. hey, the guy's open, get him the ball and boom. So that, that to me is a bigger problem is 
I don't love the offense. It's not my favorite in the world, but I also feel that four or five plays are there to be made each game that he's just simply not making that could really turn these games around. And the plays that are really killing them are the turnovers inside their own end of the field, which is seems like it happens every single week. I mean, he's got 14 interceptions. I think nine of them have happened on the wrong side of the field. So uh, bad decisions in there. And I don't know how they fix this, Andrew, because the contract situation or where they are, the messaging that you're giving hurts. I mean, they're in a really tough spot here. How do they how do they manage this moving forward? What do you do over these final six games? And then, you know, your, your decision in going to next year is, is this our guy? I got a guy I drafted in the second round coming in off of a season where my quarterback was horrible. Where, where does this franchise kind of go from here if they don't end up, you know, turning this thing around over the last six games? Well, if they continue to do what they're doing, they're going to have so many questions going into the offseason because you're not going to get a clear picture of what you really have as a team. What I think needs to happen, Mike, is they have to reevaluate who's calling the plays here. Give Rich Gangarello an opportunity to call plays. That way, they can see what Carson can do with another with another voice and another you know another idea and, and under a different scheme and, and maybe maybe they play to his strengths maybe there's certain things in there that he really thrives off of and then you go into the off season with, with a little bit fewer questions about your franchise quarterback um, if they continue to have Doug Peterson call these plays well you're going to get the same results and and it's not going to be good for Doug either so. I mean, I think the only thing that they can do right now, you know, coming down the stretch here is really reevaluate who's calling the plays. Did you think it was interesting that at the end of the first half after Josh Sweat got a sack that Doug did not call his timeouts and he pretty much said, hey, let's go to halftime? It just doesn't seem like Doug. Is that him? We talk about the messaging. Is that a message to the team saying, look, I don't trust you right now. Let's get to the locker room. Yeah, that's exactly how I took it. I remember when, when when Sweat made that sack, I was like, all right, here comes a timeout. And the timeout never came. And I'm like, huh. Well, I mean, that to me looks like a coach that didn't that has lost some confidence in his team and wanted to play it safe and just get to the half. Um, I mean I mean that 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 that's a problem and, and that message that kind of message tends to resonate to a locker room. Knowing going from a guy who's always been known as uh, as an aggressive shot caller, as just someone who's always going to, you know, stand behind his team and go, and go for the jugular. I mean, he didn't, he, he didn't do that. And um, I mean, that, that definitely wasn't lost on me. Um, it's crazy because at the end there, you're right. He got asked about the timeout. And then at the end of the game last night, he's like, I don't even remember what's going on. You're going to have to remind me. I mean, it just seems uh, that there is a disconnect everywhere that Doug Carson, it almost feels like Carson doesn't want to be here anymore. Like, do you get that feeling that that Carson's in a spot where, look, the fans were split. They they wanted Foles. They didn't want me. The organization drafted Hurts. They didn't want me. Like, does Wentz feel like I, I just th- that I the, I'm the guy that nobody wanted? Well, I, I think that kind of the the vibe that I get from from seeing it and his body language is very telling uh, to me. It seems just like someone who's just very drained from the emotional ups and da- ups and downs of a season. Yeah, he's gotten hit. The guy's gotten hit 50 times this year. Nothing that he he seems to be doing is working. There's so many different moving pieces around him. I, I think it's more of, of an exhaustion from Carson more than I don't more than someone who doesn't want to be here. He he hasn't been on. The, it doesn't seem like he's on the same page with his head coach. These type of things just you know. And, and then you throw the COVID thing on top of everything else. Some people, everyone handles that differently. It just I think it's just a lot to digest and that's kind of what I what I gleaned from that is he just seems like kind of almost throwing your hands up like what, what like what's going on here what are we doing and um like I said I think the offense certainly needs a shot in the arm in order to kind of you know right this ship um if that can even be if it can if it can be salvaged and I think Rich Gangarello calling the plays would be the first step do you think that Doug Peterson has final say on benching Carson Wentz or Jason Peters? If not, is that a major issue? Like, if this head coach looks at this guy as a major problem and wants to make the change and he's not allowed, maybe because of ownership or the GM, I mean, that's got to be an issue. Um, I, I think that he does. He, he does have say in that, and I think that's the reason why Carson's still there. I, I mean, I think that if it were anybody else calling shots, especially Howie Roseman, for example, who was behind the Jalen Hurts pick? I, I think that you might see Jalen in there a little bit more. I mean, Jalen Rager or Jalen Hurts, so we had 
I believe, 15. He always, he's always touched the ball 15 times this season. Um, and and it, 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 to me, it does show that Doug is back in Carson, and, and that truly is his guy, because I do think that if someone else were in his ear telling him what to do, um, I, think this, I think that he would be pulled uh, by now. Yeah, I know that um, this team's in a stuck kind of between a rock and a hard place, Andrew, because I know the fans don't want to hear about the division, but the organization can't be in the division race and then just give up on it. So when you're in the race, you're going to play your veterans. It's not They can't justify mm-hmm. playing and looking at younger players when you are in first place. Uh, yeah, yes and no, but are, are, the, are, are the veterans producing? Or are they hurting you more than they're helping you? Well, that's in a Jason fair question. Peter's case, in Jason Peters' case, he's hurting the Eagles more than he's helping them. I think that putting a guy out there like Jordan Mailata, who you know is going to be available, which is first and foremost a, a, a priority. He's going to be available play in and play out. He's going to give maximum effort, and he's shown that he has potential worth developing. I think that – and then when you look at um, – let's take, take Alshon Jeffrey, for example – He's hurting the offense in his limited opportunities that more than he's helped them in, in you know over the past couple of weeks. Uh, he should not be taking snaps. Certainly shouldn't be taking snaps from developmental p- players who have produced like Travis Fulgham um, or John Hightower, who's only played one snap. I mean, the, the offense looks stagnant. Well, he's one of your speed guys. Why not uncork deep pass for John Hightower and let him run under it? These are these are things that that, that just don't make sense to me. That's why I think you have to pick your spots. But some of the, I think that the, some of these veterans aren't aren't necessarily uh, helping the team get to where they want to go. Right. I mean, that's a fair point. Is are they helping you? But at the same time, like Alshon Jeffrey, they're going to the guy that he knows what he can do, as opposed to saying John Hightower. You had nine games, and what really has John Hightower shown other than a play here and a play there? That's where I think Doug is in a tough spot too. Is hey, I got these guys that I know what they can do. We're in the race. I mean, look, it's a, it's not in an enviable position to be 3-6-1 and one and be in first place. Most teams at 3-6-1 and one can start to look ahead to next season. Yeah, I mean, right now they have no choice but to play their best players. Right. And like I said, in some, in some, of their, in some instances. Or, they're most, they're, they're, or the guys they have the most intel on. Well, yeah, I would say that, but I'd also say they have to play their best players if they want a chance to win this thing. And in this case, some of their best, some of their better players are the younger players over the over the uh, the kind of the veterans that they that they are attached to. So, I mean, I think there needs to be a balance there, but you, they certainly can't they can't play they can't you know play favorites and go to the veterans if if they have younger options sitting there on the bench or on the inactive list that could be helping the team get to where they want to go. All right, Andrew DeCecco, football at four. Of course, every day right here, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. The guys dropped their latest pod at 6 a.m. this morning. They'll have another one on Wednesday and Friday. And, of course, uh, every day right here during football at four, brought to you by PlaySugarHouse.com. Andrew, happy Thanksgiving, man, and uh, we will catch up with you soon. All right, guys, sounds good. Take care. Happy Thanksgiving. Andrew DeCecco, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda hotline. So there you go. There's so much there. You know, that's another thing is – Okay, we want to start evaluating the younger players. The problem is your 3-6-1 and one record has you in first place, and I know the fans don't want to hear about first place. Everyone's sick of we're in first place. They're not going to be in first place after Thursday unless, of course, uh, there's a tie, on, on, and I wouldn't be surprised, between Washington and Dallas.